Welcome to the, this is March, right? The March Angular <laughs> JS Up Meetup, <laughs> sponsored by Calcomi. And uh, this month we're going to talk about HTTP interceptors. I don't know how many people, how many people have actually done something with an HTTP interceptor? About three or four, okay, five. So I don't know how many people know what they are, but we'll talk about them. They're basically a factory component that you can use that will intercept the request sent by the HTTP service as you send the request, as you receive the request. You're actually in the pipeline before it goes out and in the pipeline as soon as it comes in. And then also whenever there's an error um, that may be thrown by the pipeline, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a request error message and a response error. So you can basically get in, get in the air handling pipeline and the transmit and receive pipeline. Now there's also transformation um, utilities that you can do and if so, this is more for things like I need to add a header into something or I want to put a timestamp in my data uh, or I want to handle the, error, the errors that come back and maybe gracefully um, you know, recover from an error. Uh, if you're going to look at doing translations, like you need to translate JSON to XML or you want to take and encrypt something and then put it on the wire and decrypt it, you, know, you want to use the, there's, uh, the transformation input and, and output routines that you would use in the HTTP service. Uh, and you can, also, uh, you can also do stuff synchronous or asynchronously in, the, in these areas because you can give back a, a promise and then as you resolve your promise, <coughs> So like if you needed to go out and do like an authentication to someplace else and, and then once you got it back, give it to the pipeline to use, you can actually do that. Um, so here's the de facto um, definition. And there's four methods that you can override and they're all optional. You need at least, I, I would say if you're going to use an interceptor, you need to at least override one. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's not much of an interceptor, right? So you have, you have the request uh, method, which is going to give you the config, and that's the same config that you hand off to the HTTP service to go actually make your request. So you, in there, you have the URL, you have the data, you have the request parameters, um, you, have, you have access to headers and all sorts of different things. Um, then you've got the, re, the request error and that's going to actually, if for some reason down the pipeline something else throws an exception or something, it's going to invoke that request error method. And then you can handle that. And then you could turn around and do something else to gracefully uh, recover from it. Because you could also use the request error for when you get a redirect to authenticate against a site. Um, and then we have the response method, which is going to be given to you as it's coming back up the pipeline. Um, and you get the, you actually get the response data object. You you can have access to the config object as well, and then you have the response error, and that's basically if somebody throws a 500 error or a 400 error or something like that that they're getting back from the server, it's going to invoke that method. And I'm going to I'm going to show examples of using the request method and the response method and the response error method tonight. So you'll get an example of how to handle like errors and how to um, how to basically insert stuff into a request as it goes out and then uh, add stuff on the request as it comes back. And then the last thing you do is down here in the bottom you'll see this HTTP provider interceptors.push and you pass in the name of your interceptor service. So what it does is it sticks it in the pipeline and so and it's first one in you know it's like a first in la uh, last out so if you have multiples of these and you want them to operate in a certain way, you need to look at this statement, interceptors.push, and make sure that you have them in the order that you want them to be in the pipeline. So, like, if you want something to encrypt, let's say you're, let's say, just say you're going you're gonna to jumble up the message and do an MD5 hash of the message or something, um, and then you add something into the message afterwards, and then all of a sudden your MD5 hash is messed up. Well, what you'd want to do is switch around the way that they get loaded or pushed onto the interceptor so that what, whatever is doing the hashing and doing your signature for you is actually the last thing before it would go out. Um, 
So that's all I got about interceptors. <laughs> we're going to get in and we're going to play demos. So let me get in here. and Now I created a, just a, a very simple application. It's got an, um, an express back end and, a, and an angular front end. And um, let me go ahead and I'll kick it up here. Um, and then we'll get in and play with it a little bit. So, so this is just uh, if if you if you want to do um, mean development, there, this Angular full stack um, generator is actually a really good uh, generator as far as it provides you mongoose and MongoDB stuff on the back end. It uh, has um, full express front end routing and all that, and they've actually added stuff to it so that you can create routes dynamically. You can create um, I want to call them route handlers and, and components, um, if just just from the command line. But what I've got is I've got a little database in the background as a list of cookoffs. And right now we're getting back an error. So let me make this bigger. Let's see if I remember this from. Right now we're getting not not authorized. I'm missing an API key. And that actually is being intercepted. If I do a Let's see, um, let me make this a little bit bigger. You'll see that my method failed with a, um, with a 404 not found error down there at the bottom. Because the server, if we come over here and we actually look at our server here and my, um, my API here for cook-offs, and all this is doing is pulling stuff out of a Mongo database, you know, it, it just does your, your REST API, but actually the controller is what actually goes and gets all the data, and it has this um, little component called validate API key, and what it's doing is that component's looking on the, well, I'll actually bring it up because it's right here. All it does is it takes the request and it looks for the query key, API key, pulls that out, and then checks to see if it matches my golden key, right? Otherwise, it rejects the request. So what's going on right now is since, since we're sending a request here, and let me refresh it here so you can actually see the request. Um, if we look here in the headers and that, you'll see that the request doesn't have an API key here as a, you know, as a query string parameter. So it's basically just, and there's nothing in the request headers either. So it's, we're just calling it, you know, uh, natively and raw, and what we're getting back from the server is, hey, it's not allowed. You need to provide an API key. So what we can do is we can add a, um, an interceptor. Uh, we, now, there's several ways you can add an API key, right, to your calls and your service. What we could do is we could go into our, client over here and um, let's see here it's under app and my cook off data class or data service here which is actually doing all my requests right you know I could on the end of that put question mark API key equals everything right but that that kind of screws up because what happens if your API key changes at a later time or something or you, you have multiple different APIs that you got to deal with, right? That's a lot of stuff to, to copy and paste all over your, your site. So we can create an interceptor to insert the API key into the query string so that we don't have to mess with it. The other thing, though, is, um, you know, normally if I, let me, let me turn off my error service here. Because this actually is, ha this is the first interceptor I want to go through, but let me turn it off. And I want to show you what happens um, when it's not there. So now if we refresh the site, you know, he's still failing. And we still get the error that, oh, he can't find errors. Hold on. Um, did the wrong part. I need it to just be nothing. So hold on. 
this is not the one I wanted to get rid of. So it's the error interceptor. Sorry about that. This is the one that nobody cares about. So let me just comment this out and we'll, we'll talk about it in just a second. So we, we get our stuff back, but if you notice down here on the bottom, there's nothing in errors anymore. So what I was doing with the interceptor I just commented out is I was actually capturing the error message that was coming back from the server and then putting it into a service that the application could say, hey, you know, if there's an error, give it, give it back to me. So we're no longer seeing the errors. And uh, kind of give you some background on how that was working here is, um, let me find my cook off page here. And this is a little busy here, but what we're doing is you we're saying, okay, I want to, well, let's get the, let's do the init here. We start off with, hey, give me a list of cook-offs, and then if it's successful, let's get that information and um, assign it off, and then we're going to do a timestamp, and we'll talk about the timestamps here in a little bit. Um, but then the next object, the, the error function says, okay, give me the error messages if it failed, and assign that so that we can actually put it in a list down below. Well, the way that uh, that error service, which is what I was, I, all it has is two methods, add error message and get error messages. It doesn't have anything to actually pull those error messages off of the wire or handle any of that stuff. So all this is is, a, is really just a, it's a service that sits there and ha handles error messages, but anybody can add an error message into it and anybody can pull the error messages from it, but it doesn't know anything about how error messages are generated. So our first interceptor that I'm going to introduce you to is really an interceptor that, that is responsible for monitoring response errors. And what it does here is whenever an error is thrown on a response, He's going to look at the status of the response, and if it's a 404 error, he's going to call add error message. And, and normally what happens is when the server kicks back an error message, he's going to, he, will, he may or may not give you text back. Uh, and it'll always come back in response.data if they do send uh, data as part of, as in response to it. So, um, and then we basically will reject the, the request. So it's going to kick back and it'll throw it'll get thrown into the uh, error side of the HTTP uh, then statement, or the dot error method will get executed if if you're familiar with the two. And then what we're also doing is we're just registering it here using a config um, call on the module. Any questions? Now we could take this wrapper out and we where this response.status equals 404 and we could do that for everything for all errors but right now I all I'm throwing back is a 404 error so it doesn't really you know doesn't really matter from that perspective. And matter of fact you can see I threw a 404 here. Um, let's see if I can make this bigger too. Oh, no, he won't go bigger. Um, but let's, let's uh, so now that I've uncommented this, we should now see our error messages show back up. So you see, you see the error message back up. So what's happening is when that error gets thrown on the request, he intercepts it, he calls the error service that says, here, add an error message. And then he, and then he basically causes the, met, the function, the request to fail. And then that basically throws us in the code that says, okay, I'll go see if there's any error messages and I'll display it on the screen. So we're using a bunch of little small components, putting them together, and we can reuse that error, that error service, you know, in our other screen, our other views and that. Now, the next thing we'll do is let's, uh, let's go look at uh, our API interceptor. And it's... It's not too uh, much different than the error interceptor, except that this time we're going to deal with the request method. So we're getting in the request pipeline. 
and we get the config and the first thing we check to see is there any request parameters in the configuration if not let's go ahead and create an empty object and stick it in the parameters so that we don't blow up when we assign you know params API key so so then then that way we can set the API key and then we paste in our our magic key and then we return back the config that we modified and so then that gets on down to the service and then on the wire so now what should happen if we look over here is when it refreshes you'll see our error went away and we should actually get some data yeah so we've actually got data coming back now and if you actually look at our request here oh that's not the right one um, it's this one here and I, I want you to look at something see this uh, this is HTML request and and stuff and we're going to modify this a little bit so that we don't deal with we don't put this on the end of HTML files because really we're looking at anything that's in the API space right it doesn't matter about the HTML but you'll notice see now our request has the API key on it and uh, if we look at the response he's happy with it because we actually provided the API key that they wanted and then if we go back over here you can see that he actually um, it act, it's kind of hard to see on this let's see if I can bring it up a little bit um, but it actually shows the API key down in the bottom that that it received so so again like I said all we're doing is we're modifying the params right so now what we can also do is we can look at uh, let's let's look at what the config um, um, object has so let's go over here to the book of knowledge on angular js which is the api documentation for https <laughs> and uh, am i hooked up or am i lost Oh, it's still downloading. All oh, right. So while we're waiting, who's all going to NV Vegas or NG Vegas? I went to NG Con. Oh, you did? Yeah. And how, what did you think of it? Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I go to quite a few of them around here, and that was the best conference I've ever been to. Well, that's great. It was over the top. Uh, yes, it was. Well, NG Conf was, what, two weeks ago, right? Yeah, two weeks ago in Salt Lake City. Yeah, and, in, and NG Vegas, I think, is, if I remember right, NG Vegas is in May, isn't it? <laughs> May. It's 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 coming up shortly, um, man. That's really slow. Well, let's just do. We'll just do some. Uh, let me instead of waiting for that, let's go over here to my app, and let's just use the. Let's just set a breakpoint right here. And let's refresh this, and we'll look at what comes back. So if we look at the config object over here. So we have a URL and we have, you have tram, transform request and response and those are, those are where you want to do stuff like convert stuff from JSON to XML or change everything to Pig Latin from English or whatever like that. Um, and you have the, you have the re transform request and transform response methods that you can add on. And then you've got your headers and you've, you've got basically a list of headers and then you've got your cache objects which Basically, the cache object is where it goes to when it's looking for different things, right? Uh, like your cache factory and that. Um, and so you can put stuff in there. Uh, you notice there is no params in here now, right now. So as we go through here, watch it and it'll change. And you see now we have the params object there. But it's empty right now, right? There's nothing there. So now when I set the API key now you see we've set it so 
now the HTTP service is going to see that and say, okay, I need to stick that on the end of the line. But the thing is, is that do we really want it on the HTML request? No, we only really need it for our API, so let's modify this. And so we're going to look at the URL and we're going to see, um, we're going to basically change this and say, um, really we shouldn't do this um, if uh, config.url. I'll use the index of. Um, Let's see. Well, actually, why don't we just look for slash API slash. That way we know we're on our API path, right? So, and what we want to do is we want to make sure it, it does not equal minus one. Because if it doesn't equal minus one, then we know that it's somewhere in our, our URL. So, then we'll go ahead and now what we'll do is we'll take... And we'll put this in here. So we'll only do it if the URL has slash API slash in it. Now, if we wanted to, we could also change this. And if we wanted to send a different API key to a different domain, we could also make this more complex. And so we could say, OK, I want to do one for Teams, and I want to do one for Cookoffs, and I want to do one for, you know, for X or Y. And we could put a different API key on each one of those based on the path. So let's go ahead and save this now. And what we should get, um, so now, now you notice we're, we're stopped on the, do we have API in here? No, we don't. So he's just going to return it, right? Now he's going to say, do we have API in here? Oh, you know what? I should take off the slash in front of it. Let me take care of that. So we're just looking for API slash. So we've got app cookoffs, and now API. So now we're going to basically add that on there. And so if we go back over here, you'll look that now cookoffs.html doesn't actually have the API key listed in it anymore. But our, our call to the API does. So we, we, can, we can, you know, manipulate it around that. So there is some information that you can, you can mess around with in that response. Any questions? Okay, so that's two different ones. Now we're going to look at another one called a timekeeper. Okay, and actually we should have been seeing something over here in the console. Okay, it says get cookoffs took 0 0.024 seconds. So let me let me refresh this again. Um, we'll get rid of this. So we got our cookoffs back, and it says it took 0 0.026 seconds. So what the timekeeper does is he's handling both the request and the response methods of the HTTP interceptors. And uh, so what we're doing is we're adding something into the config object. We're doing request timestamp, and then we're going to do a response timestamp. And in that way, Somebody else, when they actually get the response back in their then method, can pull that information out and display stuff. So if we go back over here and look at our cook-off controller, um, I guess i got to uncomment all these. I thought I got them all first. but So what we're going to do here now is if you update a cook-off, we're going to basically pull the response timestamp and the request timestamp and get a time interval. And then we're going to basically log that to the console. And then here's the one for get cookoffs. Uh, this is in our update function. So in that one, we're basically pulling it back and we're giving back the request get cookoffs took X. Now we could also take and actually change this, which we'll do in a minute, and we'll actually move this code to the timekeeper because why do you need to write that why do you need to pull that around we could actually just put it in there and do a console log so we can do that here in the next and then here's our other ones over here um, let me uh, break them off 
So, th and again, this is some very basic um, request response processing. So what happens is, um, and we'll kind of show you here in a second. By default, we have our git cookoffs, right? And this happens whenever we load the um, view up. And then um, when, with a list, you can actually add a new cookoff, which is going to basically switch you over to a form. And that's going to have an empty object in it. You can fill it in and then click update. And it, and what the, or you can edit a cook off. So what it'll do is it'll take the index of the item in the list and then pull that out of the array and, and allow you to edit it and then you update it. And then it call it actually calls this update method. Well, if it's a new cook off object it's not going to have an underscore ID uh, property on it because it hasn't been created yet in the Mongo database. So it's, that's what we're using as our key. If we don't have an ID, we know it hasn't been inserted into the database yet. So in this case here, if it does have a dot underscore ID, then we'll call the update method on our cookoff data service. And he'll go through, he'll update it. And then once it's successful, we'll go ahead and we'll list the response or the time it took. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to refresh the cook-off list so that we refresh the, the site. Now we could get a little bit fancier in this, but this way we, we're hitting the, the thing twice in the background. Now if it doesn't have an ID, then we're calling add cook-off, which is going to insert it into the database. And on success, it's going to basically list out how long it took, and then it's going to call get cook-offs, and it's going to refresh itself. And then if if either one of them errors out, it calls get error messages. And then we clear out the cook off and we go back to our list view. So let me save this, make sure everything got saved. So let me, uh, I'm going to make this, I'm going to bring this back to about 100% for a second so you guys can actually see. And that works, 175. You guys can all still see that in the back. Okay, so like, as I was saying, like, here's the edit, and this gives us our little, um, little thing. I, you know, I think they should actually give out $150,000 in prize money, so we're going to change that and, and update it. And then you'll see down here in the bottom, you know, request update cook-off took 0 0.029 seconds, and then get cook-offs put 0 0.02. And then if we actually go back here, that was the Cedar Fest, right? You see my little change took. Uh, so we'll cancel out of this. Now let's go add a new one. And the name of the cook-off, we'll call it Jim's Big Barbecue Bash. I'll put it in Texas. And you know what? I think it needs to be on the 4th of July because that's when all the good parties are, right? That won't work. Well, it's a good one. Okay. And let's say KCBS Red. Oh, no. Let's say Rib Liquor Fred. And contest number 666. And their prize money is going to be a buck fifty. Hey, they're poor, they're on the farm. And you'll see here that add cook-off took 0 .00 sec seconds, and it took a little bit longer to, to pull it back. So that's one way to do, do that. Well, like I said earlier, we can actually change this. We can get rid of all that, because why, why do we need all that? We can actually just go ahead, and we can use the URL on the, on the response object, right? And we can take and we can do this in our timekeeper. And then we don't have to put this all over our code, which is the best thing to do, right? Each little component does one thing and one thing only. You don't have everybody doing all sorts of stuff. So let's cut that out of there right now, and let's go back to our timekeeper service. And on our response, we can just take this, but we're going to change this from 
get cookoffs, we're going to use config.url, right? So we'll put this here plus response.config.url plus took. And then uh, the reason I want to keep that in there is in case somebody else was using those timestamps, we don't, we don't interfere with them in our code, right? All we're doing is we're, we're going to just move the logging to there. And so now what we should see over here is you notice now it's like APH. We get the full, you know, cook off. Say we get every request that goes through uh, the XHR, uh, yeah, X, XHR request pipeline gets that. And if you notice, all the HTML partials actually go through there. It's not like a normal browser lo load request. It's actually an XHR request. But then we also have this guy here, right? which is from our cook-off controller. If you actually look at where they both happen, these both happen in time service, and that one happened in the cook-off controller. So let's go delete all that stuff out of the cook-off controller, or I'll comment it all out. I don't want to delete it. So, um, and let's um, command Z to return that. But now let's hide it. And let's hide this one. And let's hide this one. See, so look at all that code we got rid of by moving those two lines into an interceptor. <laughs> so that should be everything. So now we should see that when I come over here and I just click. If I just go down here and I change this back to 15,000 and we update it, you'll notice that the timekeeper service is the only thing that's now emitting those out. So, any questions? Any ideas that, how you could use this? All right, now there's another one in here that actually comes with the Angular full stack, which is actually pretty nice and um, and it's much more in depth than these here so um, we go under I think it's under components and there's this auth service here and um, let's see is this it no this is this is not it that's the authorization service that's not the one I'm looking for let's see is it this one? No. I know there's one in here. It's probably up here. Uh, no, it can't be those. Where is it? Oh, here it is. The author. This is the authentication interceptor. So now. By default, you can when you run the Angular full stack project and create it, you can say it'll ask you if you want to create a, an authorization, an OAuth generator, and and what they do is they use this interceptor to go through and say, okay, I need to basically check and see if there's a token, and if not, I'll have to redirect the person to the login page and and log in um, based on what's going on. So if you notice here is that um, the request is always going to look to see if there's a cook there's a token in the cookie store and then he's going to basically add that on to the authorization header or change the authorization header to be bearer space and then whatever that that cookie is that token cookie is um, but what it does is before that happens is whenever a response kicks back and it's 401, which means you're not author, you know, it's forbidden or you need to log in, I think it is. It actually redirects you to the login page automatically. So you can basically, whenever the site, whenever the site kicks back a 401, it'll automatically log, uh, redirect you to the login page. And then he'll basically remove the old cookie and then once you, you've posted back your login, it'll get the new cookie and then it'll, it'll go back up to the, the request function and stick it in there. So we can kind of watch how that happens. So 
let's go back over here to our sources and um, let's go down here to app.js and find our so that's the request and there's the response so So now he's look, it's looking to see if we have config headers. So, and uh, there's an object, and all we have is an accept header, right? So it's going to basically say, okay, I don't have a token cookie, so it's going to skip over putting in the authorization header. So we're not authorized at this point. So it's just going to go ahead and move forward, and he's going to do that with every request. So what we're going to do, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to click on login. And um, we'll go ahead and log in so that we can actually see this cookie come back. And why not be the admin? So now let's see. Now he's got, or he's hoping he's got an authorization header here. So now you notice we've got a cookie here now after we did the login. So now it's going to basically add that authorization uh, header to every request. So now if I click over here on the admin page, you can actually get to it. So what we could do is let's log out. And let's go to the admin page. Let's try to get to the admin page again. Oh, we got an error. 401. Oh, well, they kicked it back. I should have stepped into it. The user and user API routes are restricted to users with admin role. So he's basically kicking back an error message back saying, you can't go there, right? And if we look here, I should have stepped into it to see what's going on. Let's try it again. Um, okay. Well, that's interesting. It says the status is undefined. Ooh. So our response is actually unauthorized. No authorization header was found. So he's just kicking it back. And I'm sure it's probably... Uh, that's probably what's kicking it back because really you have no response at that moment. And actually, if you look at the network, what's coming back on the network? You know, um, if we look at preview, really it isn't sending anything back other than the 401 in that. So there is no dot status. He's coming back because it's an error. But now if I log in again, um, well, let's, let's log in as test at test.com. And now let's try to go to the admin page and see what happens. Now we got a forbidden response now. So he's failing that back. So we're getting the same thing. Let me change our password. Now, and this is just straight out, this is just straight out of the the bottle here so we'll log in let's go to the admin page and now we shouldn't get to the error we get to the admin page now so that's a little way you can handle you know uh, authorization redirects and and things of that nature to do all your authorization and again what it's doing is it's letting the web server tell you you don't you don't have access to this and based on that error message that's coming back it's, re it's supposed to redirect you to the login page. And that way you don't have to code that all over your views. When you get redirected to some place, what it should do is say, oh, you're not allowed here, so I'm going to redirect you to log in from that perspective. Yes? Well, 
Well, I mean, most people's browser timeouts are, what, about 60 seconds, I think. But since it's actually, now here's the nice thing about this being a JavaScript call that it may be actually doing to do the LDAP authentication in that. It can go on and on and on because we've had some things that go several minutes uh, when we have, like, really big orders <laughs> that are going back and recalculating. And as long as you're as long as you're still feeding something back to it or whatever, he'll go, he's okay. Yeah. Um, you, but you can change in the config, and I and I think you can set other parts in the HTTP request to set your timeout so that you're going to time out after a certain time too. So you can actually change that as part of your as part of your request timeout in that. But by default, I've had stuff just sit there and spin and spin and spin and wait for the back end server to come back, especially when I'm working over VPN. And I've got a slow link or something, but but you'd lose customers before that, right? If if you had somebody sitting there waiting to be authenticated and it's spinning and spinning, you're gonna say to hell with that, and you're gonna close down the browser and go someplace else. <laughs> but I would I would hope if you're authenticating stuff on that, you're you're really close, even if your LDAP server is really close to you, you know, in, at least within your data center. If you had to go to a third-party data center, it might be a pain. Um, and that's actually where you can, I wanted to bring up this ex, this other example. I've got a couple of, um, and I've, uh, let's see here. Um, I got, there's, I want to say this one. And, um, and, and they'll be on the end here. Um, so this intercepts, interceptors in Angular JS and useful examples. Um, it goes into the basics of what we're talking about, but he also has some examples of how to do things in an asynchronous manner. And, it, and so what he's doing is in the request function, um, he creates the the deferred object using the queue service, and then he goes out and does his asynchronous op operation. And then once that returns back, if it's successful, then he's going to call deferred.resolve or he's going to call deferred.reject. But at the bottom here, he's going to return back the promise, just like you would do with normal promise uh, processing. So what's going to happen is he's going to basically return back that promise. And then the next guy in the pipeline that is waiting to do something with that object is going to wait until that promise has actually been resolved. So you could essentially go out and if, let's say that you had something where you needed to basically have a revolving key that you get from another server that changes every five minutes or something that you have to keep sending to your other servers. You could essentially in this code here make the request to go get that key, you know, if, it, if it's expired so that you can, re and then put it in your authorization header so that you can authenticate with the other server. So, so at, in something like this, and so what will happen is basically the request will wait until that key comes back and then you resolve the, the promise and then it would move on down the pipeline. So that's another way you could do it. And so, so you can use this deser the deferred resolve um, and reject. So if it fails, you can reject it, which then is going to trigger off the request error method in the HTTP interceptors. So we could do something to that. And then here's, here's another one. This is actually in a response where he's, he's, doing, he's doing the same thing, but he's using a response object in the response method. Yes? So would you use this for like uh, protecting certain routes for, for roles, certain roles? Uh, the like the well, you can use, inter okay, so the question is, can you use, the, can you use interceptors to protect routes? You can, uh, but actually you should use route change start. Okay. And, and uh, I think it's route change start, because you get a route change start, and you get a route change success and error, and I think a route change in. And it's better to do it the route change start. Okay. Uh, and so what you, and actually that's how we did it, is we look at the route change start method, we look at what the next URL is going to be, and then if, if it's a protected URL, like let's say account information or something, then we check to see if the user's logged in. If not, then we'll redirect them to login slash whatever that URL is. What about uh, baseball roles? Like, where would you guys configure that? Are you trying to protect the route based on roles? Are you configuring that when you're setting up the routes? Or? 
Well, I do, I do, I do mostly API work, so we, we protect the APIs based on rollback, but on the server. So all the client is seeing is, you know, a success or a forbidden or an authenticate type of response. But you can do the same thing on your views. You could actually say, but it, I would never, here's the thing. When you're doing something that has protected views on it, it's better to move those views into a totally different SP, portion, or SPA by itself so that every page that you actually go to that is like protected. So like a good example is if, let's say that you've got a, um, an online ordering app that does credit card processing. Nobody should really see the credit card ever, right, through that whole thing, except for one person, and that's the one person that's actually having to deal with, with issues with the credit card processing, right? So what I would do so that nobody ever has a chance to get to that page except for that one person is that that is going to be in a separate little, you know, single page application or web page by itself that is protected by the server so that, you know, you, your server credentials are going to allow you there. Right. I might have an index.html that hosts the major application, you know, and then I might have, uh, let's say that I have functions to manage products, manage uh, orders and stuff like that. I might have a, a products.html and orders.html, and then those might have different roles associated with them. And then that way, based on when you logged in, you would see new menus that may pop up. But I would make sure that those menus come from my server. That, they, that they're not encoded in my HTML. Because the number one mistake a lot of people think that make is they think that if I don't show it, nobody's ever going to access it. And if I, and if I ng if it, nobody's ever going to manipulate the parameters to hide it. So the best thing is, is if you don't want somebody to get to it unless they actually have the, the re, or they have a right to be there, you know, you should not, you should not make it available to them. In the, in the single page application from a security perspective. So like a uh, good example is we're working on the back end to our online ordering s system, you know, and we do chain based ordering. And so we have franchises, you know, that tie up into a chain. Well, there are certain things that the chain, you know, leadership should see. There are certain things that the franchisee owner should see. There are certain things that the managers at each one of the stores should see. But like a manager at a store, shouldn't see what's going on at the chain level. You know, he, he should only be worried about what he sees. And so what we do is you come back and you get a menu based upon your role in the organization. And so you may have, at a, at a store level, you may have five things that come back in the menu. You may be able to look at your sales. You may be able to change your store hours. You may be able to change your store pricing. And that's it. And then at the franchise level, you may have six items, and you get, and one of those is all my stores for my franchise. And at the chain level, it may be all stores, and they may have seven or eight items. So that's that's the type of thing you need to think about when you're you're putting an app together, because a lot of people will say, "Oh, I can put all this stuff in one big JavaScript file and have a bunch of stuff." But it's better to think about, you know, your your SPAs, and sometimes. It doesn't hurt to go to a different, in, you know, a different HTML file if you're doing different things. Yeah, you. Yeah, well, once you authenticate with the server, right, you're not leaving the server. Sure. So, and, and so a good example is um, with ASP.NET. You know, if you log in through their membership provider, they create a they create a cookie, their forms auth cookie, and you can set it for an expiration. You know, it could be 20 minutes. It could be two weeks. It could be, you know, it could be a year or so, depending on what your policy is. As long and and what that actually has in it is really nothing more than your user ID for the for the application. So when it comes up and you, it gives you back the the identity, which is a username, and then you can go look up the user, and then you know what his roles and responsibilities and that are. So that's but that's residing as a cookie on on the client machine. Um, so, so then you don't have to go back and re-authenticate as long as that's still valid. And browsers are really good at getting rid of cookies when, they're, when they expire. 
And they're really good at not sending cookies if you mark them as HTTPS and you try to go to them over HTTP. Because <laughs> we have a couple of those where we have session IDs and, if, and they're always marked HTTPS only, but then we're working locally on our local machine and all of a sudden things don't work because our session, it issues the session ID over and over and over, but since we're not sending to, you know, we're, we're doing HTTP local host, it's, it looks at us like, well, did you really think I was going to send that back? So, any other questions? But this, like I said, this is a really good site, and, uh, and um, this is another good one here, in a little bit more detail. And let's see. That was it for that guy. I, I, these are the references. I'll post the, a link to this up uh, in the uh, discussion board uh, along with the source code, uh, the link to the GitHub for the source code. And then once I get this moved up to YouTube, it'll be there as well. Um, and this will be basically at my GitHub. Just look for HTTP inter interceptor example. And that's pretty much it. Anything else? Any questions, guys?